Today, I wanted to cover side scan mosaicing and give you some tricks and tips, or at least kind of the workflow that we use in house at CTI to make kind of good looking uh, mosaics. And um, <clears throat> this kind of assumes you know a little bit about SonarWiz already. So if you've if you've never used SonarWiz, I'm not going to go over all the basics. We're just going to talk about uh, side scan mosaicing and and uh, export options and stuff that can affect how your images actually look. So side scan mosaicing tips, and like I said, uh, this is a uh, about an intermediate level stuff. I ex I assume you have some basic introduction to Sonar was already under your belt, and this will take about 45 minutes. So the goal here is the, I mean a lot of times you see on our documentation and our presentations and stuff that we have these you know really beautiful side scan mosaics. Here's one that is in three dimensions. Yeah, you can see topography is laid underneath it. There's good definition between the sand and the mud and rocky reefs. Here's another one we show a lot. Uh, it's kind of got sandy areas and these rocky outcrops. And underneath, you can see the 3D uh, seismic profiles that were collected at the same time. Those are really cool. And sometimes, um, you just see these just gorgeous uh, presentations here. This is from the kind of North Atlantic uh, kind of pro-glacial area. So there's a lot of these rocky reefs. Uh, there's areas here where you can see kind of, you've got these sandy reefs and there's you can actually see the sand crossing or fading out as the currents have drifted the shell hash or whatever is on this rock all the way across. So these, these mosaics are, you can see each track line here uh, a little bit, and the actual data is so clean and so good, you can see it across multiple track lines. And that's that's really our goal for today, is kind of how do we make these nice looking uh, mosaics? Um, here's another one that's uh, spectacular. This is what the data looks like when it's raw and first come in. It was collected uh, by an expert, it was well done, and uh, the data is beautiful, but it still needs a lot of work before you have a nice mosaic. Um, we have nice straight lines. There's good definition of the uh, amplitude intensity across the whole survey. Um, but still, there was it was it must have been some weather out there. You can see there's stripiness in the data. And with the processing and with a little help uh, from SonarWiz, you can get this data set to look like this. It's it's spectacular. And so that's. That's what we're going to talk about today, kind of raising your mosaic and game. So uh, my agenda today is to talk about uh, some tips and tricks about collecting the data. I mean, ultimately, if your data is no good coming in, there's only so much SonarWiz can do. We'll go over import settings that affect how your mosaic actually looks. Uh, I'll just touch briefly on navigation and projection information. Um, in particular, I'll show you some things that you should look for in your data sets before you create your mosaics. We'll talk a little bit about using gain settings effectively and uh, what your goal is uh, with the gains. Just uh, throughout the whole presentation, we're going to talk about colors and view properties that kind of raise the how, how, how those work in SonarWiz and what they're doing when you create your mosaic. And then uh, spend a few minutes talking about kind of a pretty complicated dialogue in SonarWiz is the export uh, settings. There's multiple ways to get your mosaic out of SonarWiz and we'll briefly touch on that. And then finally, uh, if we have some time at the very end, we'll go over uh, questions and answers. So let's start with collecting the data. The most important question you have to ask before you go out there is what is the goal of the mosaic? There are two broad categories of uses for a mosaic. Um, and by mosaic, we mean that, you know, a picture of the seafloor where you've gathered together multiple track lines and you want them all to look like a seamless image. That's the goal. Um, but why are you collecting that? If the object is to get uh, targets, are you looking for underwater ordnance? Are you looking for are you looking for a pipeline inspection, or is it a habitat map that you're trying to map out where uh, marine uh, marine biology is, or geology is actually located on the seafloor? 
And the way you process the mosaics will be different depending on what those goals are. Another thing you really need to keep in mind is what is the ultimate output resolution going to be? If, if you're delivering a one meter grid to your clients uh, over a very large area, then you don't need to collect or process five centimeter data. So all that does is just waste time. What, um, what we want to do is kind of match the output to the input. Um, some other things are kind of beyond the scope of our conversation here is what is the equipment selection going to be like? Do you have the right frequency? Higher frequency data or higher frequency sonars can see more texture down on the seabed, or, but they don't get any penetration. So if you're really interested in geology, you want a lower frequency. High frequencies can see more details, but they don't have as good a range. Um, are you going to have a calibrated system? Uh, most side scans are not calibrated, um, but a lot of new multi-beams are. Um, we're not going to talk about multi-beam uh, backscatter collection today, but the principles are pretty similar. Um, you have to pay attention to your survey design. Side scan is still very sensitive to how you actually run your track lines and how fast you're going, what your fish altitude is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of those in a moment. And then finally, there's these environmental things that are you going to stop the survey if the weather is bad? You know, we showed you in that previous slide that you can have stripes in the data if it gets too, if there's too much weather or um, there's just things you can't control. Is the bottom composition okay for this kind of survey that you're trying to do? I've been doing surveys in estuaries uh, where there's so much motion or there's the picnic line between the freshwater and the the salt water really made it difficult to penetrate down into the seabed. Before we get deep, too deep into this, I want to just talk about what side scan image construction looks like. Uh, initially, what our, our side scan here is being towed like this, and what we collect is amplitude versus time. And then you have a stack of pings on top of each other, and this creates our side scan waterfall. And by the, what SonarWiz is going to do is we're going to convert these time versus amplitudes into ranges, and we use our our slant range correction here to do that. And then we apply navigation. So each ping is placed in the world where it actually was collected. So what looks, you know, often get this question like, well, it looks so good in the waterfall, but when we look in our mosaic, it, it looks kind of messy. And the reason is that if your fish isn't towed smoothly at a, a nice steady speed with a, a nice clean line through the water, you wind up having to mose what you're actually shooting is twisting and turning like this and it can cause problems with your mosaic as an example uh, the first thing you need to worry about is your speed through the water so here we just have on the left the long track kind of a diagram of our different uh, pings going out if we're changing speed or we're in a like a wavy environment where we're kind of climbing up uh, the wave and then you slide down into the trough again, as the speed increases and decreases, you're separating uh, the ping spacing. And this is very obvious uh, in side scan surveys. The, if you really want high resolution data, you have to survey slowly. Uh, that's the only way to get enough pings on the ground uh, to make up a nice square kind of survey area. Most side scans have extremely high resolution in the across track. Uh, direction. But the long track direction is totally controlled by your speed through the water. So you have to control that. When you're turning in during a side scan, this can also cause problems. So we almost always recommend for mosaicing that you have nice straight lines. And the reason is that when you turn, these pings have to be mapped uh, out here and you, you wind up with, with a change in density as you go from one side to the other. So on the on here we have the the starboard side, uh, we're piling pings up all together, and on the port side they're spreading out. When this is what it looks like in SonarWiz. So here we've got a turn uh, where the the data was recorded through a turn, and you can kind of see I plotted this up so you could see the individual samples with no interpolation between them, and you can kind of see where they sort of pile up on top of each other. Uh, here on the inside of the turn. And on the outside of the turn, there aren't enough samples to completely cover the area. Um, this is the way SonarWiz normally looks like that. So it just sort of 
smears out the imagery. And there's not a whole lot uh, that we can do about this other than just trim out these turns and try to fill them back in. So in short, um, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out. If you've got to actually collect good, clean data in order for us to make nice mosaics. So I think that's uh, the most important thing. So let's actually get to SonarWiz um, and talk about uh, when you import your data. Okay, so I have a I have a project set up here, and we're going to work with a, a data set that was uh, donated to SonarWiz uh, earlier this year by one of our uh, clients, and was really happy that they shared it with us. It's an AUV and an IVER data set. It's got like five or six track lines in it, or maybe 10 track lines, and it's, it's really pretty. So what we're gonna do is look at the side scan import settings. So we have, we have nine track lines here, and I wanna go into, before we import this data, I wanna go into these advanced setting dialogue here and talk a little bit about this. One of the most important things um, that you need to pay attention to when you import data is the samples per channel that is set. SonarWiz supports three different across track resolutions, and we always downsample your data to one of these three settings. So it's either 1,024 samples per channel, so that'd be 1,024 samples on the starboard side and 1,024 samples on the port side. Or you can use 2048 or 4096. And there's often question about, well, what setting should I use? Um, some people just default for the highest resolution possible. But again, like I mentioned at the beginning, if your goal is to make a one meter resolution uh, output, you don't need to carry around 4,096 samples per channel. When you think about this, this is 4,096 on the port side, 4,096 on the starboard side, and you're pinging 20 times per second for five or six days. That is a lot of data to push through SonarWiz. In fact, um, I have a slide here that shows what the across track resolution is for each one of these uh, settings. So here is, in this, in this chart, we've got the slant range down here at the bottom. So this is zero, 50 meter, 100 meter, 150 meter. And each one of these lines represents uh, the different settings. So at 1024, at 50 meters, you have five meter res or five centimeter resolution. Um, at 100 meters, you would have 10 centimeter resolution. And if that's good enough, then uh, for your output, then you would save a lot of processing time to use the lowest uh, across track resolution here. The uh, middle one, this 10 or 2048 sample, at 50 meters, it's about two centimeter resolution. And at 100 meters, it's 50 centimeters. So basically it doubles each time. Uh, the highest resolution we support currently in SonarWiz is, is the 4096 per channel. And that gives you five centimeter resolution all the way out to 200 meters. Um, but keep in mind, this is the across track samples. The real resolution of your survey is set by your speed because if you're only paying, if you're traveling through water 10, uh, 10 centimeters or 20 centimeters between pings, then that is what is controlling what your resolution is, not the across track resolution. So let's go back here. The next thing that can affect your uh, image is how you set these sample compression values. Now this is a new setting to newer versions of SonarWiz. Um, in SonarWiz 7, we switched to storing floating point numbers inside of uh, our CSF files. And that means that no matter what value your side scan actually produces, we uh, store that value and we can store any value. There, there used to be this old dance in SonarWiz where you'd have to match an 8-bit color palette up to whatever your sonar was did. And you had to sniff the file and match histograms and all that, but that's all gone out the window. But uh, for larger projects, um, by storing every value that your sonar could produce, we made these gigantic files and we were literally having professional, or not professional, but uh, some of our larger surveys were so big you couldn't get a hard drive that would hold them all. So we introduced uh, compression. And this has been sort of an experimental uh, thing for us as we've learned what really works and what doesn't. And basically what happens is we take the ping values that come in, no matter what they are, and we convert them into either an 8-bit, a 16-bit, or a floating point number. 
If you store the floating point, there's no compression at all. Um, if you use 8-bit, you get four times compression, so the file size is reduced by four. And if you use 16-bit, it's reduced by two. What we've kind of learned over the course of implementing this over the last year or so is that 8-bit compression is sometimes too much. If you use, especially if you use this 8-bit scaled, it tends to clip the data. And if you have a lot of dynamic range in your, in your um, sonar data, basically if it goes from zero to 1,000, we're gonna take that zero to 1,000 and divide it in 256 values. And you have these big jumps between the values. So it's too much uh, for many data sets. If you have an older 8-bit sonar, then this is all you need. But for the newer ones, uh, we recommend going up to 16-bit scale. And um, it is possible to, so each CSF file stores your raw samples and your process samples um, separately. So you can have different compression depending on, um, or for each one of these lines. And for example, you might want to use 16-bit here and try 8-bit there. Um, I think, I think it's not necessary. If you've got the storage space to do 16-bit, that's what I would recommend. So we've got the sample size. So we're gonna use uh, this middle one, this 2048 samples, uh, which will give us five centimeter resolution out to about 100 meters. And then the uh, final thing we wanna look at here is how we're gonna project the data. So there's two options uh, for heading. Uh, we can use the course made good, or we can use the sensor heading. Sensor heading only works if you've calibrated your side scan compass before you went underwater, or you have some kind of uh, IMU. Now in the case of this AUV data that we're gonna import, uh, it had a full motion sensor in it, so our sensor heading is really good. But a lot of, a lot of uh, toad side scans have a compass built into them or some sort of motion sensor, and if they're not calibrated, they're useless. So then we recommend using course made good. Um, you can also do pitch correction, which is more important for um, kind of pole mounted side scans. It will work for this AUV because we have pitch information. So I guess the key point here is use the smallest value for samples per channel uh, that will produce an across track resolution that you can live with. Because the more data you push through uh, the system, the longer everything takes. So we're gonna use 2048 for this sample. So let's bring these guys in and we'll let this load. So here is our uh, mosaic. So there's a, lot to, there's a lot to see here. First of all, it's a cool data set. There's um, plenty of stuff to see here. Um, one thing that I, I can look at right away is we've got lines going in different directions. This makes it hard for a mosaic to look good, especially with side scan. So if a side scan is towed properly, it's down low to the seabed. And so you, it casts shadows on either side of the transducers. So if you have side scan going in different directions, you get shadows being cast in different directions. And this can make uh, your mosaic look bad. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is just uh, turn off this line that is going in the wrong direction here. And turn this guy off. And that will help a little bit. The second thing that we can see here is that the bottom track has these really, um, yeah, well, you have to pay attention to how your data lines up. And so we've got a couple of things that we need to make sure it looks decent. Um, if we open up the bottom track here, it looks to me like, uh, Although this data was collected with an interferometer and it has bathymetry with it, the uh, offset of the bathy track line and the actual imagery is pretty, so if we look up here, you can see what the range is. And this one is off by about a meter. So it goes from the track lines at 17.5 meters and the first good pixel is around 18.3. So I, I think it would be worth retracking this. 
and before the presentation, I kind of went through and found um, some settings that work best, and actually our edge detection works really well. And if we re-track uh, this using the edge detection, it will it does a pretty good job. There might be a few spots in the data set where that doesn't work, but we'll we'll go with that. So I'm going to apply the edge detection and close it. And you can see now that track line kind of closes up and we have data all the way into the center. So let's um, copy that. Or we're, what we're going to do is use our batch bottom tracker here and use edge detection on all the track lines. So we'll just track them all. This will take a second. So what we want to do is try and minimize uh, the errors in the nadir. This can be a source of kind of ugly mosaics. If your track line kind of floats in and out of the water column, as you go down, uh, down the line, you'll see these little lenses or fish eyes. Uh, there's probably little things kind of like this. Um, there's a little bit of it here. And if we were, uh, if we had time, this is definitely somewhere it's gone off. So if we look at, you can see these little fish, fish eye lenses here. If we look at the bottom track, I bet you that it did not do so well down there. So if we come down here to the bottom, yeah, you can see that where there was some kind of noise in the water column here, and the track line didn't didn't really stay on the seafloor there. So I'll just clean this up a tad and save it. Let's see if that helped a little bit. Yeah, not a, not an <clears throat> not enough. Another trick you can do if you have a if you have a a problem line like this is go into the bottom tracker and we have oops we have this um, offset altitude and what that is used for is a situation like this where you've got, maybe you don't have time to go back through and do a real detailed bottom track again. So what you can do is offset the altitude a little bit, say maybe uh, 25 centimeters. And it slides the, the track line into the data a little bit. And we'll hopefully uh, push it close enough that it kind of reduces this artifact here. We can apply it and see if it works. Okay, I'm gonna close this now. And there, just a little bit of pushing that, uh, using that offset altitude kind of cleaned up that spot here. Uh, you, you don't wanna overuse that because that's, that's basically lowering your fish altitude by 25 centimeters. Um, on, a, on a track line this large, where we've got you know 70, 65, 70 meter uh, range, uh, that's a very small offset to your your data, but it does shift all of the pixels inward by 25 centimeters. The next thing you want to make sure is that you've got nice alignment um, between your overlapping track lines. So if we look at this object in, we've got two overlapping track lines here. And if I select one of these guys and I use our swipe tool, I can see that the old, we've got two track lines going in opposite directions, but they don't line up exactly with each other here. So normal for a toad side scan, this is probably um, you need to account for your sheave offset. So there is your toe point a little bit off center on the boat. Is it backwards on the boat? Um, a real easy way to kind of correct this kind of problem, the, the simple way and the hard way. The simple way uh, I'm gonna use here, we're gonna just use a little feature and I'm gonna identify a point on this, uh, right on the center of this rock here. And then I'll turn that line off and I'll put another feature you know, right where that rock occurs over here. And then we can measure the difference between those two. We can see that there's a little bit of a horizontal offset or an east-west offset and a north-south offset. So this one is in the along track direction and it's about 4.2 meters between these two, these two points. 
And then there's maybe a one meter offset port and starboard. So we can go into our sheave offsets here. So let's select this. We'll turn them both back on again. Now go down here to our offsets here, and I'm going to turn on layback calculations, and I'm going to add. So the distance between this was what did I say it was? Two meters, four meters, 4.2. So that's about if we divide that by two, it's about 2.1 meters. So we'll add that to the y here, 2.1. And I think there's maybe a 50 centimeter offset in the x direction. So let's apply that to, let's apply those to all of these files. So we'll just take our offsets and our layback settings and sheaves. That's what I mean. So we've got layback is on and we have these X, Y, and Z offsets. Now I'll just apply it to all of them. Now as it recomputes here, doesn't look like I moved it in the right direction here. See, I get them all on. Oops, I forgot to enable sheave offsets. So when I you have to have both of these check marks. This is a actually a common problem. Uh, you have to have laybacks turned on and you have to have the sheaves turned on in order for this offset to work. So I'll go back in here and make sure that I've done it right. Apply all these settings. The sheave computations, and the sheave toe point is basically from your GPS position, you've got a port and starboard offset and a fore and aft offset to the toe point. When you're working with an AUV, the, the toe point, these are very similar to uh, where the pole would be mounted or where the, the transducer is mounted relative to your position sensor. So now it looks like we've got a single, nope, it's not quite done yet. There we go. So now we notice, okay, we've still got our original two points there, but now our target is, is right in the center of them and it crosses correctly. So that's really important. Um, before you do any mosaicing, you need to make sure your bottom track looks good and you need to make sure your navigation is good. So when we zoom out, we don't have uh, blurry offsets uh, that are due just to the fact that our track lines aren't aligned. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, gains. So we can see if we isolate one of these um, one of these track lines that there is a strong time varying gain going on. So here at the center, uh, at the nadir area, it's pretty bright. So it's bright and then it fades away. Uh, and then we get very little signal out here. And what, what we want to do is apply gain so that we get a nice even gain all the way across the track line. So back to our uh, presentation here. SonarWiz has a lot of um, gain options built in. Uh, the most commonly used these days are AGC, AutoTVG, and EGN. I don't have time to go into all of the details uh, of these gain algorithms uh, for this talk, but it is worth noting that they really have an impact on what your data looks like. This uh, survey here is, is quite large, and I had, um, this is another uh, customer's data set from a few years ago, and we processed the data using all three algorithms so that we could see what they looked like. AGC, or automatic gain control, is really optimized for working on small sections of a track line. So if you're looking for targets like a shipwreck or an airplane or something like that, it maximizes the dynamic range of a small area, and it has a tendency to remove uh, geology. And that's the problem when you're making a mosaic. So we took this, this data set and ran AGC on it. So the settings were the same for every single track line, and it looked like a big gray blob. You can't see anything. The next option was the auto TVG. And auto TVG has a bit of a memory, so it it corrects um, it corrects the data, but it then kind of remembers over time what its previous correction was. And this helps preserve geology a little bit, but 
you can see here it kind of acts like an edge detection filter. So it's still overall, everything is gray, but whenever you change geology, so when you go from a rocky reef onto sand, you get a strong uh, gradient there, and so you can see it in the, out, the output. And then when you jump back on it again, it, it, it kind of gets another edge. So it acts like, like it's detecting the edges, but doesn't preserve the overall uh, grayscale the way you want it to. EGN was designed to avoid those problems of both AGC and auto TVG. It, it tries to build a model or a signature of your sonar and apply that uniformly to all the track lines. And so the pixels get corrected the same way every single every single line. And it remembers what it's done and so so that pixels in one side of the survey can be compared to pixels in the other side of the survey. And so here you can actually see the geology popping out. So for mosaics where this is your goal uh, to see geologic features or marine habitat, uh, we recommend using EGN. So let's take a look at that in real life here. So we've got a um, single track line here and we could, we go into settings, we'll go enable EGN and we're gonna build an EGN table. So this is usually the first step of EGN. So we go through and we build a signature of our sonar. And the best way to do this is to feed in all of the data in your data set. It has to, there's a couple of restrictions to this. It has to all be from the same sonar system. They should all be operated at the same power and pulse widths if you have control over those and the same frequency. You can have more than one EGN table in a project. So if you're mixing sonars or you're mixing settings, then you should process each of those separately. But for this, uh, we have nine track lines and they were all collected at the same time. So we can build a single table to represent all of them. While that's, that's building its table, I'm gonna kind of talk about what these tables are actually doing. So here is kind of a conventional view of a mosaic. We've got four track lines, one, two, three, four, and we lay them down on top of each other. And where there's overlap, we average the values together. And why do we average the values where they, they cover up? And the reason we're doing that is to try to minimize the artifacts that come from the sonar system and show just the underlying geology that's underneath them. If we had enough time, we could survey this hundreds and hundreds of times and average those surveys together. And eventually, uh, the thing that stays the same is the geology. The thing that's different are the artifacts from our sonar. And we would eventually get rid of all of these track line artifacts and we would just have one clean <clears throat> one clean view of the seafloor. What EGN does, so the averaging you know, keeps the things that are the same, which is the seafloor, and it averages out the noise or the artifacts that come from the, the system itself. Now, what EGN does is it takes this idea and turns it on its head. It says, we will need to find what that noise is. So we need to put this in a reference frame. We take this amplitude data and map it in a way that we can actually see the noise and we want the geology to be uh, erased. So we take exactly the same data and instead of plotting it as an X, Y, Z value on the seabed, we plot it on a plot like this, where in this plot, the transducer, the sonar is up here at zero, zero. And we've taken the amplitudes and we plotted them uh, as a function of depth or altitude and horizontal range. And now we, so if we just keep stacking ping after ping after ping up, we eventually build a signature of our sonar system that is very sensitive to artifacts in our sonar. So this particular one was built from a Swath Plus from 10 years ago or so. And we can see the, Different, this is the actual pattern, uh, the beam pattern of the system. So it's a side scan interferometer, it's similar to what we're, we're using an Edge Tech 2205 in this uh, example. So this is kind of similar geometry, uh, but this is an older design. You can see here these beams coming off. And again, this is just data that was collected on the seafloor, but instead of plotting it, on XYZ, we're plotting it in this reference frame where it's pinned to the transducer. 
And by stacking it up, we can see all of uh, the artifacts. Now that we know where they are, we can go back and correct for them. So every time we correct, we go back to the beginning again, we look up a value and say, okay, this particular sample was at 30 meters depth from the transducer and it's 70 meters away. And that, that's a little bit bright, so we need to tone it down. And in fact, if you look at, uh, if you look at this data, oops, here, you can kind of see where it's, it's not very bright there, uh, then it gets kind of bright, and then it fades away. And we're seeing that here. It's bright, then it gets fades away like this. So now we have these corrections. We can take something that looks like this, and when it's raw, and clean it up so it looks very, very clean. So we've done that. Our table's made now. So we've got uh, a table here, and we just need to apply it uh, to our track line. So now it has applied and it's corrected that uh, offset. And we can, or it, it's gained up these lines. So here we're going to apply it to everything. So you right click here and say make others like this. And we're going to, we want to do uh, all settings. But what we're really interested in here is this EGN value. So we're saying every track line use the same EGN table. This takes a second to process. And now it's much better. Even the line uh, that is going the wrong direction has been corrected. And now that it's got good gains on it, uh, it it's almost invisible. I'm still gonna turn it off because I think our data looks better without it. And now we're starting to get something that looks pretty good. I wanna talk a minute about the uh, colors settings in here because these can be a little bit confusing. When you open up the color window, um, we see a histogram of all of the enabled lines in our file. So each one of these track lines has plotted its amplitude values here. And down here you've got the scale mode. So here's where we pick our, our color map. And I have my own custom version of MSDL bronze I like. And then down here I've got things set to scale mode all data. So Manual is easy to understand. In manual mode, every single track line gets colored uh, from the minimum value to the maximum. So the minimum right now is 107, and the maximum is 3538. I'm not sure what these units are. They're just what the sonar uh, recorded. And you can kind of change how this looks by adjusting that manually. And if you're in manual mode, you've got two buttons here. One says scale to data, and that just uh, sets the lowest value at the minimum value. So 9.5 was the minimum that we observed and the maximum was some outlier at 24,000. That's, so you can kind of see you've got a big tail here. So if you want to get the colors to look the way you, you know, to look nice, you can just do this manually. That's one way to do it. Um, another way is uh, to use these auto modes and uh, auto all data, what it does is it uh, it tries to find the best value, usually like the middle 80% of your data uh, for the entire histogram and applies the same to every single track line. Another useful mode is this auto this data. And what it does is it, it gives a different mapping to each one of your track lines. Sometimes you've got one track line that is uh, much brighter than the others. Uh, if you use this auto this data, that will some, it, treats that separately. So it'll, it'll, this track line gets a value, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, they all get values. Um, and in some cases that's a, especially when you're messing around with the gains for each track line individually, this can help. But for, since we used EGN and we used it the same on all of them, the auto all data actually looks best and we have the best match there. So that's kind of a brief overview of what these color modes do. The other thing that affects how uh, data looks in our mosaic is the overlap mode. So if you have it set to shine through, where right here we've got an area of where two track lines are overlapping with each other. And we have to decide what color pixel is gonna actually show through. Um, the different modes here are shine through, and in this case, uh, the brightest pixel in the stack shows through, or you can average them together 
which is what this does. EGN usually looks pretty good with average. And then you've got cover up, which is a traditional stack where you control the stacking of the different layers. If you get close, you can kind of see an edge. Here's the edge of one, one line versus the other. Um, depending on your mosaic, different things look better. But usually for a, a good mosaic, I think average works best. Uh, or root mean square is another, it's another way to take the average. So now we've got our mosaic. It's positioned in the right place. Um, and we're ready to, to kind of make products from this. So let me turn off anything I don't want to export. So like these feature dots, I don't need those. And let's go into this uh, export dialog. So when you export um, an image from SonarWiz, what I usually do is just click this fit to, fit to window. Now we've got our edges snapped there and SonarWiz will export whatever is showing in the window. So we have two different output options. You can save the project as a geo image or you can save it as tiles. If you go to save as geo image, this is where we have kind of a complicated export option. So first of all, you can export these images in multiple different file types. Uh, GeoTIFF is the default, but you can also make JPEGs, PNG files, ERDAS Imagine files, bitmaps, and there's several others. Each one of these file types has certain limitations. Um, even though GeoTIFF is the most common export format, it's actually a really old format, and it has some problems uh, with compatibility between different programs. For example, it, the largest file you can make a GeoTIFF out of is only four gigabytes. So if you try to export a giant bay survey at 10 centimeter resolution, it's possible that it will be too large uh, for a GeoTIFF. You might be able to get away with that with a JPEG 2000. Uh, you can have enormous files in some of these other data types. The other thing, uh, stumbling block for people is this bit, bit uh, color resolution. There are three options currently, 8-bit, 24-bit, and 32-bit. So if you select 8-bit, what you're going to get 256 values for every pixel in the image. And those pixels or those values are going to be mapped to a color map. So there'll be an index in the image and it says color zero is the background color, color one is green, color two is red, and so on all the way down. Uh, this is a very compact way to export data. And some people like it because uh, I think zero is always the background color. So you can load this into a GIS and say, make color zero invisible. That's uh, pretty simple to understand. The downside is that if you have this high dynamic range sonar, you only have 256 colors for the entire range. And sometimes that looks a little pixelated. The next option is 24 bit. And this switches the way the, the image is actually produced. Instead of having just a color map, an index, you have three different numbers that represent a pixel. One is for the reds, one is for the greens, and one is for the blues. Each one of those has 256 values, and that's stored as an eight, eight bit number. So if you add those up, red, green, blue, eight times three is 24, and that's uh, what you get here. Now, a 24 bit geotiff has no way to make a background color transparent. So, because there's no transparency layer, all we have are reds, greens, and blues. And unless it's, it can be very difficult, you can't make some of these file formats have transparency with 24 bits. So mostly what I recommend is this 32 bit option. And what that does is you have one channel that's red, one channel that's green, one channel that's blue, and we add another eight bits that gets us up to 32 that is called an alpha channel. And that says for every pixel, how transparent is this particular pixel? It's a mask that goes on top. Not all um, output software supports 32-bit geotiffs, but I think ARC does now, and most, most of the modern uh, systems do. And this allows you to have a background transparency. The next thing I recommend is uh, when you are exporting data, you want to pay attention to what your color map has. So in this case, our color map ranges from black to gold. And see how I've chosen a contrasting color uh, for our background that does not appear in the data. So in this case, it's blue. 
So you don't want to choose black as your background if black is in your data set, because what can happen is areas like this where there's a strong shadow might, might be, if they're exactly the same color as the background, then they will get removed from the data set. So before you do your exports, make sure your background is a contrasting color that does not appear in your output. And then finally, we've got to specify an image resolution here. So SonarWizard, this doesn't care what the image resolution is inside the program for display purposes. This is the only place where you actually set that up. And it will tell you here uh, what, so for a 20 centimeter resolution, our output is going to be 4,546 by 2,464 pixels. And you want to make sure that this value is not too large. If it gets more than uh, four gigabytes uh, total value, then a GeoTIFF can't handle it. And you may find that some of your downstream programs have trouble with very large TIFFs or very large JPEGs or whatever. Um, if it turns out you need a 10 centimeter resolution and it's too big for a single image, you need to switch over to make tiles. So for this case, I think we're okay uh, making a 20 centimeter resolution. So we'll export that out. Takes a minute, it opens it up. And if we click full, full screen, it's actually, oops, it looks really nice. Okay. But you, know, you notice it's got these rough edges on here. So something else we can do is add a little feature, a feature in here that will just kind of trim our area of interest, area of interest. And we can draw a box around it like this, and just inside the data. And you might have an actual survey polygon that was provided to you by your uh, customers. So now we've got a survey polygon here. And if we go back into our geo image export, there's this line here, it says crop the image to the area of interest. Let's export that again. You can use different uh, if you have a river or something like that, where you have a polygon that outlines the river shape or a port and harbor, you can clip out the individual, you know, keys and piers and that sort of thing. I've just done a uh, square. So now it has a nice, neat edge all the way around it. If, if you can't export everything into a single image like this, the next option would be to use your mosaic as tiles. And for example, if if we wanted to do 10 centimeter tiles, 100 meters by 100 meters, uh, you can click this preview button and it'll show you that this would make 42 individual images. And SonarWiz is drawn in pink here, uh, what each one of those images will look like. And this takes a little bit longer to export, so I'm not gonna demonstrate it uh, today. No, it doesn't take that long for a small data set like this. But um, what you get is a shape file that represents the the map of different tiles, plus you get one tile uh, for each one of these outputs. And you can load the whole kit and caboodle into uh, GIS and kind of click on the tile to have them show up in the right place. But this is the tool you want to use if you have a really large area and you need very high resolution. So the final kind of cool thing we can do uh, with our mosaics is uh, drape them over the top of bathymetry if you have it. So in this case, since this was an interferometric system, um, we do have bathymetry. So we've got a bathy file here. So I've got some nice bathy that goes with it. And if I add this image that I just created, um, so we're gonna go to uh, maps, add base map, and we'll add our image there. So you can it file underneath there. What I can do is go to view, enable 3D. And then 
Oops, I've got this thing turned on. We're going to show the, we've got our 3D image here. You can see it's kind of, you can zoom in and out here. Select, now we'll go back over here and select our TIFF that we just loaded. And down here in the properties, it says display in 3D. So now our TIFF is kind of floating in space up above our data set here. If we go up here to this small menu, and we select our grid, there's an option here to drape an image over the top of the grid. And we've got our image loaded, so we'll just snap those two together like that. And now we have a perfectly registered side scan mosaic on top of our bathymetry. And we can adjust the vertical resolution. They're totally, they're perfectly aligned and registered with each other. So um, that is uh, pretty much everything I wanted to talk about today. The, uh, you know, to just kind of summarize what we were, went over with here. Oops, let me look at this. We uh, talked about today, uh, collecting your data is really important. You, how you collect it has a lot to do with, with the kind of mosaic that you're actually gonna see. If you collect good, clean data with nice straight lines at a steady speed, it's much easier to make a nice mosaic from that. If you just survey all over the place like spaghetti, it's really hard to put that all back together and make it look nice. Um, your import settings control what the ultimate resolution is gonna be. So you want to set an appropriate import resolution to the output that you intend to do. So if you need 10 centimeter resolution output, then you have to import at the highest possible across track resolution. Uh, but don't fixate too much on the across track resolution because the it's the speed through the water that is usually the limiting factor on how much data you have. Um, pay attention to your navigation and your projection settings. You wanna make sure that your track lines really line up nicely. If you're gonna mosaic things together, you wanna make sure that the rock uh, that you image in line one is in exactly the same place on line two. If they're, if they're shadows or they're offset by 10 meters, it's just gonna look kind of blurry. It's gonna look like a mess. Uh, using gains for mosaics, most of the time you'll probably want to use EGN for a, a large scale mosaic like this. It does the best job of preserving the rocks and the, the sand and grains and that sort of thing. And then kind of how you set your view properties is obviously subjective and personal, but there's quite a bit of control over how uh, the settings actually work and what color schemes you can use. And then when you finally come to the exports themselves, uh, pay attention to what uh, your output is going to be. Uh, do you need an uh, alpha layer? Do you want to make the background transparent? Uh, are you going to use a color map? That sort of thing. So um, the, the next thing I want to talk about uh, is that we're going to do this again next week. So if you'd like to join us for bathymetric processing tools, Harold is going to go over some of the new tools we put into SonarWiz for um, processing or analyzing your bathymetry data. So things like our patch test tool and a beam performance test and that sort of thing. So thank you for listening. Um, and I wanna thank you, uh, special thank you to Orca Maritime which shared the data with us that we were using today. And I've got a few minutes, I think, uh, where I can try to answer a few questions if uh, there are. Okay, is it possible for us to generate the same depth range domain display for our amplitudes? Ah, so uh, the, I think this question has to do with the EGN tables that are created. And the answer is not really. Um, you actually, you can open the EGN tables. Uh, you can open them in SonarWiz actually, but they don't look like I showed you. They're, because we store the data uh, in a different way. Let me open up a uh, EGN table in SonarWiz. So, you can add them as a base map. If you go into your uh, EGN folder, you'll see there's different uh, tables in here, an average table, uh, correction table, account, 
smooth table and a summary. So if we add the smoothed one, and we're going to have to fake a projection for this thing. So let me turn this guy off. The tables themselves are obviously not mapped in space and time, but you can open them in SonarWiz by going, pretending that they're an elevation data set and loading them in. So what we're actually seeing here is what a real table looks like. And uh, this, they're arranged, um, so they're kind of reversed from what we were seeing before. The, the transducer's down here at the bottom. And this is slant range versus beam angle this way. So this, it should be flat if it were projected in the real world, but, but because the range or slant range is increasing, uh, it starts to bend like an upside down or like a bowl here. Here's the real bright spot, the sweet spot of the sonar. But you can look at them that way. Um, on your data, I could see bright spots near Nader on one line. It seems to have affected the EGN on some of the other lines. A smoothing algorithm uh, might be useful on EGN. Um, actually, sometimes, uh, yes. And there is, uh, there is some smoothing going on inside of the EGN algorithm itself. But uh, I think the, the actual bigger problem is that in some parts of the domain, especially around uh, the Nader where the the angles are changing rapidly, the, uh, the tables probably don't have enough resolution. And some of that stuff goes away if you have more data to feed into it. Uh, do you recommend any Nader filter? And if so, what value should be used? The, the Nader filter uh, <clears throat> works best if you have homogeneous data. So if you have uh, like a, if you're surveying a sandy plain and you see really strong Nader artifacts, you can use the Nader filter to kind of make those, those go away. And I usually only use it when I have kind of a, a low resolution or a small scale map that I'm creating. If you want to make a map of a giant bay, you can eliminate those Nader artifacts from that low, that big picture. But if you zoom in, you often can still see that it, what it's really doing is kind of blurring the Nader out. And it does not look good if the terrain is really rocky or there's a lot of sand waves going across because it doesn't, it's not smart enough to interpolate the sand waves across different pings. So I, I have mixed feelings about the Nader thing. It's something that I wrote a few years ago to try to make better mosaics, but it, it's, I think it's still a work in progress. Um, can you load bathymetry from third-party processing software? The answer is yes. Uh, we support many, many, many different file formats for bathymetry. And then, uh, are there any options to choose raw or process sample data when viewing or exporting Mosaic? Uh, the answer is not, not directly. You're always seeing process data in the Mosaic screen of SonarWiz. So if you, uh, let's go back here to our data set. Um, I turn this guy off. And we'll zoom to this. Um, whatever is shown in the screen is what Sona was exports. So if you want to see the raw data, um, you would have to go into settings and turn everything off. So if you if you turn all of these um, all these gain settings off, then you're looking at the raw data. And then you can export it that way. Uh, where can we find a recording of the session? We'll send that out to everybody uh, so you can see it again. And then how do you overlay side scanner bathy data on sub-bottom data? It actually works the same way. And we're going to have a special session on sub-bottoms actually in three weeks. So maybe I'll show you how to do uh, 3D data that way. So I think that's about all the time for questions I've got. Uh, if you want to keep typing them in there, uh, what we'll do is go through all of the questions, other than the ones about me turning on my, my screen, and we'll send those out with typed up answers. And we'll send that to everybody who's registered for the webinar. And I, I, really, appreciate, um, I really appreciate you taking the time out to listen to us. And hopefully, you'll join us next week for Harold's talk. Um, again, that's uh, going to be about the same time on Wednesday next week about bathymetric processing tools.
right? Thank you very much.